Have you ever had an iambic paddle that you wanted to hook up to an old radio that didn't have a keyer circuit built into it? Me neither, but sometimes you just want to play with some gear. Let's get over to the workbench and see what's going on with this, the Autech Research CMOS Keyer Mark I. It's got a really long name. Let's go. We have the Autech Research Message Memory CMOS Keyer Mark I. I kept wanting to call this the CMOS Killer. Don't know. At any rate, what do you do with this thing? So if you have an iambic paddle, Morse code key like this with, with two paddles instead of just the single lever paddle, and you have a radio, not like this one, but you have a radio that doesn't support an iambic paddle. So this one here, I can set it to be key mode manual. You can use this device to turn iambic paddle pulses into straight key pulses for your radio and bridge the technology gap between the generations. Awesome, but it can do so much more than that. So even if you did have a radio that had an iambic paddle support, you could still use this, and here's, here's why. First off, this could be your training device. It has a built-in volume knob. So this is your practice keyer. You know how to practice Morse code. You're getting positive feedback. You can learn at different speeds, And that was the dashes. How about that for a, a, how about that for a dip? That's crazy. Okay, so we'll put this at a more reasonable speed, right about 12 o'clock. Yep, sure. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. The next thing that you can do is you can use this to have memories. It's got an A, B, C, and D memory. And this thing is very old school technology, which is really neat. I like the way that this is working out. It doesn't record just the, on off, it's actually recording the timing built in. So when I go to program this and I'm at an awkward angle, so forgive my already poor CW skills for getting even worse, we're gonna stick this into record mode, we're gonna reset, we're gonna hit A. And you saw that that was kind of stuttered and there was some pauses and whatnot in there. I'm gonna wait for this light to go out. It's erasing the rest of the memory for key A. And I can actually turn the speed up to get to the end of the memory faster. Now we can put it back into play mode and you'll be able to hear just how bad that keying was a second time. I'm gonna move the key over to somewhere where it's a little bit easier for me to operate. And we're gonna record that again. So I'm gonna reset, I'm gonna pick A. Wait, wait, wait. And there was some mess there at the end. Turn the speed up so we get to the end faster. And then we're gonna put this back into play mode. The gap. Cool, okay, so you can do that. I'm gonna put it into record mode and I'm gonna record just CQ by itself. Speed it up, whoop. I messed that up. I don't know what that was supposed to do. New feature. If you turn it past the end of the speed setting, it just goes into solid on. So what did we actually record? Put it into play mode. Hit the speed back where we were before. Okay, so that didn't do anything. Nothing to worry about there. All right, let's get back to recording. Record, reset, A. Okay, and now we can put it into play mode. We can put it into repeat mode. And it's gonna play out the end of that first memory. Any second now. So it's just gonna repeat that. But the repeat time was the entire memory. So there's a, another thing that this thing does and it says this combined CD mode. So let's record something in CD mode, because here's an interesting thing that happens when you're recording. You run out of memory on the four different channels. So let's record C. And I just ran out 
at the end of C. So if I play back C, So I left out in the middle of my nine. Let's do this a different way. We're gonna record C again, but we're gonna only do the first call sign. Reset C. So we're gonna record C. Up to the end of the last call sign. And we're out of that. Now we're gonna record D, and D is gonna be the second half of that. So two more call signs and the letter K. Now that we have C and D recorded, C is CQ, CQ, CQ from KM9G, stop. And then D is KM9G, KM9G, K. So I wanna combine the two of those in play mode. Let's go. There we go, it combined memory C and memory D. So you could do your CQ call, you could do your contest exchange, you could do your thank you 73 QRZ for your next call. And you could, once you get that practice part down, you could run the entire contest all the way through like that. So that's pretty slick. Let's show you how it gets wired up in the back. So in the back we have our paddle plug, which is a stereo quarter inch jack, and I have a quarter inch jack to eighth inch jack adapter, and that's where my paddle is plugged in. Over here you can run this off of battery power anywhere from 9 to 14 volts. So this will run right off of your shack power. This is your positive and negative connection for your radio and all you know a typical straight key all it's doing is closing a circuit. So that's all that is is closing the circuit. And then this is an AC wall cord because this will plug in and power directly off of AC. So there's a built-in converter. We'll take a look at this inside in a minute. On the back of the radio it just takes the two RCA plugs and I have an RCA to eighth inch adapter, and it plugs right into your regular radio's key port. There you go. So you could actually take this thing portable and run it off of battery power. Let's go take a look at it on the bench. Here we are with the Autech Research Message Memory CMOS Keyer Mark I. It's still a bad name. On the bench, let's get this thing taken apart. I'm gonna assume that those two screws are for the speaker, and I'm gonna try and leave them behind. And let's get our Phillips head screws on the side open. Oh, neat. It's got a piece of hardware cloth holding the speaker in place. Oh, that's pretty cool. This is such an old fashioned design. The circuit traces are hand laid out. This is pretty cool. All right, it's upside down to my view here. And the speaker is soldered in place, so I can't do much with that. But let's do a little walk around the board and see what we have. Fourth week of 1984 on this chip up here, which is a CD4011BCN. This one doesn't really have a date. It's got kind of a Mitsubishi logo on it, but I don't think it is. That's an MN4001B. This one is another 48th week of 1983, CD4027BCN, behind the volume control. We have an 18th week of 79, 2102L1, PCA, 24th week of 82, CD402BCN, 48th week of 83, which is the same as this chip right above it, it's also the same model number, CD4027BCN. Over here's another couple of the same chips. And what I'm looking for is the actual logic chip. This is pretty neat. Not a whole lot going on in here. Just a couple of memory chips. Everything is put into a socket for easy serviceability. And nothing on the bottom of the board. And all of your wires line up on the side over here. Let's get this thing put back together. All right, from the internal archaeology we just did, we can tell that this was built no earlier than 1984. It has a nice hammered finish on the outside, which is reminiscent of, you know, late 50s through the 60s cars. That was pretty cool. Inside of the owner's manual, 
is a complete schematic of how the thing works. The schematic is broken down into the keyer circuitry, into the memory circuitry, and into the output monitor circuitry. And in the memory circuit, we have memory, first memory counter, main counter, the C or D message, the A or B message. They're stored inside of those two chips there. The memory controller. Then on the back, we have a circuit layout. And the circuit layout tells you which kind of chips they are. So if you wanted to, you could fully recreate this thing from scratch. This was a pretty neat little note here in the owner's manual. When power is first applied to the keyer, the monitor may come on continuously or be erratic. And by monitor, they mean speaker. This is caused by an uncertain initial state of one flip-flop and is cured by sending a few dots and dashes to initialize the logic. Chips were expensive and cost was at a premium. If I was building this today, I would either put in a piece of reset circuitry or I'd put in a welcome message that when you turned it on, it said hello or hi or something. Maybe like a series of dots to to clear the memory and get you like the tail end of whatever those number of dots is and then hi or welcome or something like that. And this is what I was trying to describe a little earlier. When recording, the internal clock runs continuously to allow spaces of any length to be entered into memory. Thus, there is a random delay between zero and the length of one dot between the initial lever closure and start of a dot or dash. This requires you to synchronize your sending with the keyer to some extent. At slow speeds, 10 to 15 words per minute. Dots may even be missed occasionally. Use a hard fist at slow speeds. Don't release the dot lever until a dot starts. At higher speeds, you may not notice a difference when recording, except that mistakes may be more frequent until you develop some proficiency. The clock is triggered at all times when the memory light is out, i.e. in normal sending. So that was pretty slick. And that explains, you know, the, 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 that explains the gap between when I hit the button and when I started keying. That's actually in the memory. There's nothing that cleans up the long delay between me pushing the button and starting to do my programming. So that little bit of archaeology was, was some fun. The Autech Message Memory CMOS Killer Mark 1. What I was looking for inside, there is this chip that was made that's a keyer on a chip circuit that somebody designed that, that does 100% of the functionality of what this does, minus the speaker inside of a single chip. And it turns out that it's not in here because it says it right on the name. It's the CMOS keyer. It's, it's all built out of, you know, jelly bean logic chips and, and flip-flops and OR gates and AND gates and stuff like that. It's pretty cool that the entire schematic is in here. There was a time when you could buy a piece of technology and they would tell you every single thing that went in it and you were able to repair it. And now you buy a piece of technology and it's all secret and you can't repair it. You don't really own it. So it's kind of refreshing to see something old like this. It does still work. It works fantastically. I didn't have to do any, you know, I didn't have to, to clean any of the knobs to clean out any of the pots or anything. You don't use the pots all that much, so I can't imagine there'd be that much arcing or they'd get that dirty over time. The memory circuit works. I could see how you could take this circuit board and shrink it down into something a lot smaller today. Not even using like newer, more modern chips, just something smaller, something physically smaller, and put a battery on it and take it with you in the field if you had an older field type radio that didn't have a keyer circuit in it. So this is pretty cool. These things come up on eBay from time to time. They come up at HamFest from time to time. They are fantastic to, to play with and explore and learn about. And if it doesn't work, it's also fairly easy to fix. You would probably only need a multimeter, maybe a logic analyzer, and a couple of handfuls of chips. They do make chip testers now where you could take some of the chips that are in here and just test to make sure that they're okay. So there's lots of ways to go about fixing something like this. And I can't imagine that those chips are more than like 10 bucks for 20 at a time or something like that. So if you find one of these things, play with it. If it doesn't work, it's $25 worth of educational value for a potential repair project. Who knows? There is a video right up here I think you will enjoy next. Thanks for being awesome. I'll be over there waiting for you.